medieval Gregorian chant through the Renaissance, Baroque, classical, and romantic periods, all the way up to 20th century classical tunes. <coughs> Our guides on this musical history tour are the Open County Grassworks. Um, and please help me welcome them and their leader, Travis Cook. We're so thrilled to be here. Um, we are the Oakland County Brass Works. We're a brass quintet that plays, well, all over Oakland County, and a few others too, actually. Um, we are excited to share a lot of music with you today, and so I will just briefly explain the periods from which these songs uh, come from. Number one, because I don't want to turn this into a music history lecture, which even I fell asleep to when I was in school. Um, and also because we only have an hour, and I'd love to uh, have you hear us play as much music as we can. So, we'll start way, way back when, in the medieval period. Now, it's important to know that I'll, be, I'll give you a bunch of dates here. You don't have to write them down. There will be no quiz, I promise. This is just purely for your enjoyment. Um, when I give these date ranges, they're not... Um, like, you know, 1400 was the medieval period, and then in 1401 the Renaissance period began. Uh, music, as well as any kind of art, is really fluid, and so historians just kind of try to attribute these date ranges to reflect the kind of music that you're most likely to hear. So, the medieval period is normally considered to be 500 AD to all the way to 1400. But the piece we're going to play for you today, some of you may recognize, it's an old hymn. Uh, of the Father's Love Begotten, which actually, uh, if, if you hear it in church, this will be a different version. This is based on the Gregorian chant that it was originally based on way, way, way long ago. And um, back in the medieval time, most music was transmitted through the church. Um, there weren't, there was, A, there was not uh, education available for everybody, and B, there was no way of writing music down. The music that you see today, that we read today, was not in existence at the time. So music was an oral tradition. It would be transmitted by rote, kind of how we you know, teach our kids nursery rhymes. Um, another interesting thing about it is there will be a few measures here and there that if you're listening, you might think, gosh, it sounds like there are a few extra notes in those measures. And you'd be right. Because there was no way to write it down, the meter and the rhythm of the music was completely dependent on the text of the Catholic Mass. And so, uh, in order to produce an accurate recreation, occasionally we add a little half beat here or there uh, on a couple of the notes. Um, like I mentioned before, this is based on a Gregorian chant that you would hear in church from your, from your pastor or your, or your Catholic monk, depending on where you were. Um, I'd like to put our trumpet player, his name is Mike, on the spot here for a second. He's going to play the chant for you, and so as you listen to this piece, it's kind of something that you can belong on to and listen to.
Thank you very much. So from the medieval period, uh, right on 1401, right, we moved to the Renaissance period, uh, which is commonly attributed to the years 1400 through 1600. And in the Renaissance period, we start to have some more standardized building blocks of music. Uh, number one, they start to, thank goodness, write it down so that we can all remember the great music that was being written back then. Uh, additionally, many of the precursors to our modern brass instruments were made, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, and then one of the big things that you'll notice with our next piece is that um, there's a lot more going on. And there are some fancy terms for this. The Gregorian chant is called music in a monophonic style, which means there's only one melody happening. So, for instance, when I am singing in the shower, that is monophony. There's only one thing happening there. It may not be very good, but it's monophony. The music that we're about to play for you is, is in a polyphonic style, which means there are more than one melody, number one. And number two, these melodies are happening kind of simultaneously. Um, and so the piece I'd like to introduce now is called Canzona Personare Number no. 2, written by Giovanni Gabrielli. And Gabrielli uh, is a favorite of brass players because this was some of the first music written specifically, like I mentioned before, for the precursors to modern brass instruments. Um, and so uh, Gabrielli really began to stretch the limits of what you could do with brass instruments at the time without the benefit of machines to help you build you know, what we have today with all these buttons and slides and things. Um, the other really cool thing about Gabrielli's music is that he was the first composer to really come up with the idea of, uh, for lack of a better term, stereo sound. Okay? This music is called antiphonal music. And what would happen is, Gabrielli would write for two or three brass quintets. And so if you've ever been to a really, really old cathedral, oftentimes they have choir lofts up around the church. And he placed the quintets in the choir lofts. And so as a parishioner, you're hearing this music and it's just coming at you from all sides. Um, and it's just, I have to imagine it was pretty amazing at the time to hear something like that for the first time. Uh, so what we're going to present to you now is Giovanni Gabrielli's Canzona Persona Number no. 2. Thank you. 
Thank you. As I'm sure you heard many more notes in that one than the previous one. Um, so, we're going to move on now to the Baroque period and a composer that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But before we do, I just want to introduce uh, the members of the group. Um, I met someone in the audience that had thought she'd seen us before. Like I mentioned before, we play kind of all over at municipal events, weddings, and things like that. And many of us in the group here have known each other for a long time. This group has been together for five years now, but we've all known each other in various other musical capacities for a lot longer. Uh, so on trumpet, you already met uh, Mike Buffett. And also on trumpet, we have Dave Lurie. And over here on the French horn is Jack Lavoska. On the tenor trombone is Mr. Randy Barber. My name is Travis Cook, and this hunk of metal is called a bass trombone. Basically a substitute for a tuba. So now that we've moved into the Baroque period, and thank goodness we're writing things down, because again, I don't want to try to memorize all those notes, um, we start to have more and more, I would hesitate to say rules, but guidelines for composing music that will get played and get you hired in the court of a wealthy king or queen. Um, one of those is, it's called the concept of tonality. So obviously, um, we, as, as you've experienced music, if you put some notes together, they sound good together. If you put some notes together, they sound not so good together. And so the concept of tonality created things called scales. Anyone know what a scale is? Anyone heard of that term before? Yeah. yeah, those of you that aren't familiar, scales are a collection of eight notes that uh, in a series of whole steps and half steps, I know it might be for some of you, um, that sound good together. Basically, that's all you have to know is that they sound good together. And so in the Baroque period, they decided, hey, that's probably a good thing. So um, they, they uh, created some rules and when you're playing a song in a certain scale, it's called playing in that key. You may have heard the term, say, A minor or A major, okay? And so if you have the key of A major, there are certain notes that you play that belong to that key. And if you want to get away from A major, in the Baroque, they introduced certain rules on how to do that. You want to do that smoothly and so that it's not really abrupt. Um, you know, if I, if I had a piano here, I could demonstrate if I played an A major chord, and then say play an E flat major chord that would sound kind of strange. So they start to introduce some rules on how to do this. Um, additionally, um, they start to develop rules for how pieces should be laid out called form. And we'll talk more about that in the next period, which is the classical period. Um, so some of the composers of the Baroque era that you may know are uh, Giovanni Palestrina, William Byrd, Thomas Callas, but by far the most well-known is Johann Sebastian Bach. And so what we have here today is actually an organ piece that I've transcribed for the group here. It's uh, called the Prelude and Fugue in G Major. Nope. E minor. <laughs>
Thank you. Now, harking back to when I said that um, these, these genres are pretty fluid, <clears throat> and Bach is a really great example of that. So in this piece we just played, you may have heard towards the end, it sounds like the music and the notes that we play were steadily moving upwards, upwards and upwards and upwards, by really small increments. Um, and Bach is kind of a master of using uh, notes that don't belong in the scale, like we talked about before, but making them sound like they do. So and Bach's using, that's called chromaticism, I should mention, using notes that aren't part of the scale uh, with, with great effect. And Bach is light, was light years ahead of his time in doing that. You really don't see it like Bach did it until the Renaissance period. Um, but let's not go to the Renaissance period just yet, because we have the classical period. The classical period, as I mentioned before, took some of these forms that they started to, uh, composers started to use, and really kind of put a lockdown on them. Um, the big thing with the classical period is that it was kind of a reaction to what had come before in the Baroque period. Uh, as you've probably heard in, in that Bach, there's a lot of really intricate playing uh, that happens in Bach's music, and uh, uh, Vivaldi and Handel, a lot of that music is very um, heavily ornamented. There's lots of fast notes, little filigree here and there that makes the piece interesting. Well, in the classical period, they put a clam down on all that. That was too gregarious. We need some form, we need some structure, we need some rules here. So, what, what you have then is the birth of the symphony, as, as people know it, uh, the sonata form, and the solo concerto. Now, the thing is with these horns, is there's a lot, there's a lot of rules. You have to, if you start it, there's an introduction, but the introduction can't have anything from your main theme in it, so don't even try. So then the main theme is called the A theme. Then you have to repeat the A theme again, and then you go on to the B theme. But the B theme can't be like the A theme, and the B theme has to be in a different key, with a certain relationship to the A theme. Anyhow, like I said, this is the part that I fell asleep in class. Um, but, but all you have to know about that is that um, even though there was a lot of structure, uh, there are some of these composers that uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard have created some incredible, incredible music, uh, Beethoven being one of them, and our next piece is by another, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, kind of really took that symphonic form and ex ex explored what you could do with it, and then Beethoven picked up from there and transitioned into the Romantic period, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, the selection from Mozart we have for you is a recognizable one. Uh, it's the Eine Kleine Nacht music, and we're doing the first movement.
of the fun things about playing in a group like this is that we often play music that is not written for brass instruments. Uh, that being one of the excellent examples. Um, when you don't have to breathe, that song's a lot easier. <laughs> so now we've got all these rules, right, for the classical period. Some fabulous music, but an awful lot of rules. Well, the romantic period just turns that all on its head. Um, and Beethoven, if you, if you uh, listen to a lot of Beethoven's music, especially the symphonies, you can hear a progression away from those, like, structures into music that still has our friendly concepts of tonality, right, where certain notes sound good together, and, you know, uh, composing music within a key. However, the push here was, because there were so many rules, uh, to write music for music's sake, or music that expresses something. And so you started to get a lot of music, which we call programmatic. So, um, for instance, you might take a story, say, Star Wars, and uh, you write music that you think tells that story without words. And so that was the big thing of the Romantic period, and there are some excellent quotes essentially saying that music expresses that which words cannot. Um, and so thematical elements in the Romantic period were nature, mystic and supernatural beings, um, and there was actually a hefty um, uh, dash of national identity in there as well. Um, if you listen to Russian composers from the area like Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov, there's a lot of what we typically call Russian elements, and that's a whole other lecture that we won't get into right now, but um, the selection we have for you is from one of the most prolific composers of this area, uh, era, I should say, Richard Wagner. Wagner was famous for his operas, speaking of mythical and supernatural beings. Um, the uh, Norse mythology was his main uh, inspiration for his operas. Um, and uh, what we can listen to again here is people starting to use a lot more of those non chord tones and the chromaticism that we had talked about before. And so sometimes the switch between different key signatures wasn't always so smooth, and that's okay, because we don't care anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you listen to another, uh, another composer that's a little bit of a, a, a deeper cut, if you will, from the area is uh, Gustav Mahler. Mahler was known for um, having key relationships that didn't necessarily make sense to anybody but him. Uh, but it's fabulous music. Um, so we hope you enjoy uh, Richard Wagner's. This is the prelude for his opera, uh, Die Meistersinger.
Thank you. Uh, now that probably didn't sound too crazy to most of you. It's you know fairly standard stuff, but I, I will say, you know, people, those 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 folks wearing the wigs, and they would have just passed out had they heard that music back in the classical period, <laughs> breaking all the rules. <laughs> now, but now we come to modern music, and modern music is tricky because. Really, when, like when you're learning this in school, for instance, they just lump everything basically after 1900 into one group and call it modern music. Which, if you are alive and have ears, will realize there are a lot of different forms of modern music. Especially nowadays, with the proliferation of technology, I mean, there's, you know, you're hearing full-length scores written for movies, for film, for television, movies and film are the same thing. Movies and television video games even, I mean, there's a ton of music to choose from. So we've broken this down to a few bite-sized pieces for you. Um, in the 20th century, uh, people became more um, willing to experiment, and so they got rid of even more rules. Uh, and and so there were so many of so, uh, rules we got rid of the fact that some people began to write atonal music, which kind of sounds like I take a bunch of notes and just kind of drop them on the floor. Um, there's, a, there's a style called 12 tone writing, for instance, in our Western chromatic scale, all of the notes that we have available to us, there are 12 of them. And so in 12 tone writing, for example, you must use all 12 pitches before you can ever repeat another one, which is kind of neat in theory, for those of us who prefer Bach and Beethoven, it doesn't sound quite so neat, but out of that, you know, has, has developed more modern styles. Um, the piece that we're going to play for you here from the modern uh, repertoire is by a composer named Bela Bartok, who was a Hungarian-born composer who was still firmly rooted in tonality, you know, those notes that sound good together, but using tonality in new and different ways. And so uh, Bartok's big thing is that he was one of the first ethnomusicologists. And that's a fancy term for someone who studies the cultural and social aspects of the people who write music. So what Bartok did was he was really interested in folk songs, especially from his native region. And so what we have for you today is a uh, collection of four pieces from a humongous work that he has written called Little Pieces for Children, which were originally for the piano. We have four for you here today, and um, I think they'll appeal to just about everybody. There are definitely, um, you know, uh, the tonality that we talked about, major chords that you can hang your hat on and, and really get, get behind. But you'll hear he does a lot of interesting things with um, grouping notes together in different meters and um, utilizing vastly different tempos to um, recreate what he felt was the heart of some of this folk music. So this is Bella Bartok, um, four of, I think, 60 little pieces for children.
bit different, but not too out there. Um, uh, we have two more selections for you that I think uh, you will enjoy. As I mentioned, there is a lot of fabulous music written for movies. Um, and this next piece is entitled Grover's Corners, which is from the film uh, Our Town uh, in 1940. It's written by Aaron Copeland, and Aaron Copeland is probably one of the most <coughs> widely respected American composers of his era because he sort of started to create this American sound which incorporates, um, you know, uh, modes from the jazz idioms. The jazz is often called America's classical music, and you can definitely hear that in, in Aaron Copeland's work and work of others uh, from the American uh, kind of composing school from the early 1900s. So this is Grover's Corners. Thank you so much. This has really been a blast for us. Um, a couple of us are music teachers, and so, of course, we love getting to perform, but we love being able to share kind of the history behind the music even more. Um, so thank you to the Troy Historic Village for having us out today. Thank you all for coming and braving the heat and humidity. Um, we have one more piece for you from our American collection, and um, as I mentioned before, American classical music is kind of rooted in jazz, and um, Dixieland is one of, one of our favorite genres of the jazz idiom to play, so we've got for you, arranged by Luther Henderson, Sugar Blues. 